You may I begin? Awesome. Let's get started. Um, so firstly, a very warm welcome to all the attendees who've joined us today. Uh, this is webinar number 17, as you all know, in our GF Ideas India webinar series. GF Ideas India is the smart protein innovation community created by GFI India. It's a platform to bring together all the smart protein stakeholders in our country, whether you're an entrepreneur, researcher, a representative from the corporate, maybe a representative of uh, some company from the value chain that goes into uh, creating creation of the smart protein sector. You might be a researcher or a professional looking to apply his skills or previous background to the smart protein community. You're all welcome in this. And today we have a masterclass on extrusion technology for the Indian smart protein sector with Wenger Manufacturing. And our expert speaker for today is Natasha Tasseski. She is the process technologist uh, at the Food and Industrial Products Division uh, at Wenger Manufacturing in US. Wenger is one of the leading uh, manufacturers of extruders, and this masterclass will answer a lot of questions that we usually get from a lot of stakeholders from our community uh, and the food industry about uh, low moisture extrusion, high, high moisture extrusion, and its application in plant-based meat, eggs, and dairy products. Um, having said that, I'll, I'll invite Varun Deshpande to quickly uh, give a little bit of context today for today's webinar, and then we'll pass on to Natasha and get started with the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sardul. You can hear me, right? Yeah, okay. Um, hey, Natasha, thank you so much for joining us early in the morning in the US. Um, thank you everyone else for joining us on a Friday evening as well. So the context is this. Um, I first met Natasha and her colleague, Doug, uh, from Wenger Manufacturing in Mumbai on December 12th, 2018. And we talked about how Extrusion is a bottleneck to the growth of our sector in India. Um, and the, the few entrepreneurs that I had met at the time and the large corporations that I had met at the time uh, had all mentioned that the lack of particularly high moisture extrusion capacity in India was going to be a hindrance to their experimentation and then their production and, and uh, go to market within plant-based meats. Um, and the date today is 18th September, 2020 and we're in exactly the same position. Uh, what's actually changed between uh, December 12, 2018 and September 18th, 2020, is that now instead of there being a few entrepreneurs or a few corporations that have mentioned this to me, there have been literally on the order of 100 people uh, or 100 distinct organizations that have mentioned this problem to me over the last couple of years. So at this point, we are extremely eager and excited to work with organizations like Wenger Manufacturing to try and see what we can do to establish uh, knowledge bases as well as partnerships and build up extrusion capacity in India, as well as see how we can adapt extrusion as a technology and as a process to plant-based meat manufacturing that is fit for purpose in countries like India, whether that's using local feedstocks or um, other interesting requirements that have to do with taste parameters in the Indian population. Uh, we're also extremely glad to note um, or to let you know that Wenger Manufacturing is a partner to our upcoming Smart Protein Summit. You can see the background uh, for both Shardul and myself for the summit. Uh, we're very excited to be able to offer you this, this masterclass today as a precursor to the summit almost, uh, and then also set up meetings with Wenger over the next weeks and months as we think through how to solve this bottleneck. Um, and I hope that if we have this conversation again in a year, Natasha, we won't, we'll no longer be saying that it's as much of a bottleneck. Uh, I'm grateful to you for being here today to deliver this masterclass. Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction, Varun. It was, uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to join you guys and get to talk to everyone um, and share our experiences in this industry. Um, as you know, Winger has been around for quite some time. So um, I'll give a little bit of a history as well on that. Um, so we have quite a lot of experience in the texture protein space and we're happy to be here and support. So without further ado, I will uh, go ahead and share my presentation now. So I hope you guys are able to see that. Yep. Yes. Okay. Right. So I titled the presentation uh, Extrusion Technology for the Smart Protein Sector Matching the Smart Protein Conference coming up that Varun mentioned. And as I touched base a little bit, um, Winger has been around for 85 years. So we have about that much year that many years of equipment design and production in our in our knowledge base 
Um, we were founded uh, by a family and we're continued to be owned by the same family. Uh, we are a US-based company and our first agri-food cooking extruders were patented in 1958. And this was actually the beginning stages of production of texture proteins. Um, the first stages of evaluating how um, texture proteins may be created out of vegetable proteins. And uh, with that, in uh, 1965, our Winger Technical Center opened up, um, which was at the time the first extrusion research center available to industry to work, on, work at and develop extrusion applications. Um, and interestingly enough, um, it was around that time period that most of the patents around texture plant proteins were actually uh, filed for the first time. Uh, we opened up our overseas representation in 1973, and we introduced later on in 1983 our twin screw extruder. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between singles and twins. And I think that was a very common question that I think the GFI team um, often gets asked, and it's actually a question that I often get asked as well. Um, in addition, furthermore, in 2018, we focused on uh, introducing more sanitary um, design of equipment, and that was marked by the introduction of our sanitary dryer and the addition of our corporate project services group, um, which focuses on supporting companies with design of their facilities as well as advising on best manufacturing practices and safety standards. And uh, we've expanded our equipment offering through the acquisition of source technology which offers inline analysis and power heating technology which is another technology that may be utilized for texturizing proteins. Um, and we can always talk about that privately in a separate discussion. Today's focus will be on extrusion. Um, but just the touch base, the power heater is focused on thermal cooking process, whereas extrusion is relying both on thermal and mechanical. And finally, where we are today, uh, we're on our fourth generation winger family members, and uh, we are currently busy with the renovation of our technical center, which I'll be happy to share some photos about. And we're all very excited about this because it's been a long time coming to get this renovation since 1965. So, the basic outline for today is going to be just to cover extrusion processing, go over the different categories of texture vegetable proteins, and touch base on ingredients. And keep in mind the new product development cycle along this before we go into the Q&A session. So the aim of today is really to provide um, an overview of the process and try to answer most of the questions that I had received from GFI team um, that are most commonly asked. So with that, with that in mind, my first question to you guys is going to be how familiar are you with extrusion? And I'm going to ask Sir Dool to launch a poll at this time. So we'll give you guys about uh, 20 to 30 seconds uh, to give us an answer and Tell us whether or not, or really how familiar are you with extrusion, whether you're learning about it for the very first time, or you have experience with it, or um, you just have read about it, or you are an expert as well, um, and you have been running and working with extrusion for a long time. And extrusion is obviously not a new technology, so I anticipate to have mixed answers. So. Um, I believe awesome. that's about a good time. So you yeah. can go ahead and share results. Okay. Yep, so like I said, a diverse mixture of understanding of extrusion and the majority are somewhat familiar. So that's good for me. Uh, I can actually share a little bit of knowledge and um, provide some understanding. So to begin with that, what is extrusion? How do you find that? Uh, it's essentially to push something through a defined opening, similar to squeezing a toothpaste or uh, pressing uh, cookie dough um, or pressing ketchup out of a, a ketchup bottle. Um, however, what is different between extrusion and extrusion cooking? Um, extrusion cooking is a versatile, energy efficient, continuous cooking method that's utilizing creation of texturally and nutritionally diverse foods. So not only is it applicable to textured proteins, but it spans a really wide range of applications that um, include um, foodstuff that can be used to ensure food security, 
and to improve nutrition in malnourished areas. Um, and World uh, Food Organization oftentimes uses extrusion to provide nutritious corn soy blends um, that can be made available at an at a essentially affordable price uh, or rather free from. Um, so when you're talking about extrusion cooking, what is important to really understand in terms of extrusion cooking as a process? It's uh, really the concept of um, ha understanding that it's a process by which moistened, expansile, starchy, and proteinaceous materials are plasticized and cooked by a combination of moisture, pressure, temperature, and mechanical shear. So the unique thing about the food processing industry with extrusion is that we're dealing with biomaterials. So these are natural materials that, you know, once they are cooked, i.e. they're plasticized, um, they cannot be reversed. So it is not, um, one of the questions that I received through the poll, through the questions in advance was, can you theoretically predict this model? can you predict what's going to happen in the extrusion process to an extent um, because you're limited by your understanding of the diversity of that natural material that you're going to be working with in foodstuff whereas in plastic and volume or extrusion you can more or less have um, conditions that are predictable or materials that have certain predictable behavior or reversible behavior in the extrusion process um, and after the extrusion process with foodstuff, that is not so, not, not the case. So with extrusion, we're relying on moisture, pressure, temperature, and mechanical shear. And going into that, discussing four main things that are important when looking at the extrusion process um, and the extrusion cooking process rather. The first thing is really understanding what it is that you want to create. What is your final product? Um, and then the other question is, what raw materials do you actually have access to? Um, what is affordable? Um, how can you actually match the price point that you're trying to achieve with your final product while also retaining the product characteristics and finished properties? Um, once you know those two values, you can start looking into what kind of hardware you're able to use and what kind of hardware you will need to create that final product. Um, and to also process the raw materials that you're intending to use. And then with the extrusion process, once you decide what it is you want to make and what raw materials you want to process, then you can start looking at what processing conditions you can use and how to control that process to ensure consistency and quality. So the extrusion process um, is a very, um, oftentimes it can be confusing and um, complicated, but it's really rather a straightforward process. And the easiest way to think about it is just to think of a process flow and what happens within the system. So if we start off with the raw, our raw materials and we have a dry recipe delivery, we have a uniform flow rate of dry raw materials that we wanna feed into the system. In order to ensure that we have consistent product coming out of the end, out of the extruder here, we wanna be able to make sure that we have a consistent feed going into the system. And to do this, you can either do it in a volumetric or a gravimetric mode. Uh, the more reliable and more consistent method is the gravimetric mode, whereas volumetric is a lot more affordable. So either of these two would work. And generally, if you're really looking for process consistency and, and quality, you're gonna be relying on a gravimetric method. Um, so once the ingredient is fed, into your feeder bin, it goes through a next stage. And the next stage can be including preconditioning, which um, may or may not be needed for a given process. For most of the texture proteins, there's a considerable advantage of having preconditioning included in your process. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So the function of the preconditioner is really to hydrate, heat and mix ingredients. Um, and primarily it is really to hydrate and mix. Um, because when you're dealing with materials that may have different water uptake or may have some variation in particle size um, that may interfere with the hydration rate, having a preconditioner, you're able to ensure that you have even penetration of moisture into the particle size, into the granule. 
as you see there, there's a image of a granule with a light yellow center and an orange sphere on the outside. This essentially shows the diffusion process of water being able to penetrate the particle. So the extrusion process is a very short cooking process, so 15 to 30 seconds. With the addition of the preconditioner, you have about one minute to two minutes or longer, as can be adjusted on the process, to allow the materials to mix with water or other liquids to hydrate. Um, and also, you may be able to introduce heat as well if you need to do additional cooking before going into the extrusion process. So this is all application dependent and um, formulation dependent as well, whether or not this is um, advantageous to your process. Um, there's definitely a lot of benefits with respect to process quality, product quality, as well as wear, reduction in wear on your equipment. So having a preconditioner reduces the amount of mechanical wear you get downstream. So we fed our ingredients through our feeder. We have preconditioner raw materials. Our next stage is really to go into our extruder barrel where our actual extrusion cooking and mixing takes place. So as I mentioned, the extrusion process within the extruder barrel is 15 to 30 seconds. Um, so what happens in there is really a function of what I mentioned earlier, pressure, um, shear, and uh, heat. So the combination of these, in, these factors really helps to cook uh, a product. So with the initial stage of feeding a raw material that's in a flowable state, um, being conveyed and then compressed through the extruder barrel, and finally cooked um, and shaped at the die. So at the die is really where we create that final appearance and the final texture of our intermediate extruded product. Um, and I'd like to highlight that when you're working with extrusion, the product that you're creating at the end of the extruder barrel is generally an intermediate product. So while it can be ready to consume, it typically is meant to be with with relation to texture proteins, it's typically meant to be processed further, whether it is done by the final consumer or whether it's done by um, a manufacturing company that's ready to create a ready to eat product or a product that's gonna go into the frozen aisle section. So with that in mind, those are the basic components of the extruder, the feeder, the preconditioner, the extruder, and then the die and cutting section of the extruder. So when it comes to what is in your toolbox in terms of what can you choose when it comes to extruders, and now that you understand what happens inside of it, there's typically singles and twin screw extruders that are promoted for the food and feed industry. Um, when it comes to food processing, it really depends on what it is that you're creating and what is your final application that's gonna determine what kind of extruder you really have to have in your process. Um, and also whether or not you may need to have um, consecutive extruders in certain instances. So whether you need a forming or a cooking extruder, or you might be using extrusion for a different application um, in terms of preparing a material for further processing. So when it comes to the extrusion system, whether you're which one of these extruders you're actually looking at is really dependent on what it is you actually want to create and what are your, your you know, requirements for your finished product. So whether you choose a single or a twin screw is really dependent on what kind of raw materials and what kind of final product specifications you would be looking at. Also, what is the processing operate, process operating conditions that you will need to actually have in your process? Um, in order to achieve the final product specification. So the decision between a single and twin um, really depends on a number of factors. So where single screw extruders have been used, um, if you compare on this image, sorry, um, if, where single screw extruders used to be quite limited in the past, their ability has grown significantly. Um, so design and improvement and continuous research around equipment has essentially grown the, the, the range in terms of material process um, specifications um, and 
process operating conditions that you can actually work with on the single sphere extruder. But when it comes to texture proteins, the question is, what is the, your value? Do you want to lower your cost of operation? Do you want to improve product quality? Um, do you want ease of operation? Um, those are some, some of the questions that you would need to answer for yourself. Um, generally, what we see in the market space for the, for the past 20 years, the focus really has been on using twin screw extruders rather than single screw extruders in the industry. And this is primarily due to their versatility and flexibility, as well as due to the reduced um, cost of operation, um, which is surprising. Even though the twin screw extruder might cost a little bit more initially, the single screw costs you more money when you start actually running and having to replace worn parts. Um, when you are having some worn parts on a single screw extruder, you essentially don't really have much room or much of a window to operate in before you have to replace. Whereas with the twin screw, you still might be able to continue creating a product that's um, meeting quality requirements and specifications, even when you have significant wear on your extruder. So those are some of the decisions that you need to decide. Um, speaking of texture proteins, when we start looking at high moisture meat analogs and the kind of ingredients that tend to go into that process, um, it's really important to consider this typical range of raw material specifications. Uh, most of the protein sources tend to be very fine in particle size, and this means that you would have to have um, a positive displacement pump that's actually going to be able to convey that material. So if you think about the extruder as a positive displacement, um, uh, having a co-rotating twin screw extruder assists the process to make sure that you're able to convey the material forward towards the end of the extruder to cook at. With a single screw, you may struggle to convey because you might have a lot of product slippage. Okay. So it really is dependent on what your process happens to be. So with that, I'm gonna ask you question number two, and this is what kind of extruder are you currently using or planning to acquire? So and again, about 20, 30 seconds for you to answer this question. Um, and the choices are single screw, twin screw, you might be looking at both, or it might not be applicable to you depending on which industry sector you might be coming from. So, so do I, my rule is if 50% have answered, I am good to share the poll results and uh, see awesome. with everybody where we stand. Sure. So I'll share the results now. Um, there you go. Okay, perfect. So most of you are probably looking or using a twin screw extrusion, which is not surprising. And a big majority of you are are saying that this is not applicable to you. So this is most likely that you're coming from a different perspective. Okay. So we will continue. So when it comes to the process with texture proteins, there's three different things that we normally look at. Um, obviously, starting with the end in mind and knowing what kind of product you want to create but also understanding what ingredients and what technology and hardware and software automation you're gonna want in the process. Before we start discussing a little bit more about ingredients at this time, I'd like to just go back and start with the end in mind. And this is looking at beginning of the texture protein space and also looking at some of the different categories that are created with the extruder. So, Texture proteins are really not something new. So the spinning process is actually um, a process that's much older than extrusion and was patented in 1954. However, due to the cost of the process, this really, has, this really was not commercially viable and never really took off. Um, and with the introduction of extrusion and possibility to texture soy proteins in the early 1960s, um, dry textured extruded proteins were really the focus of the industry. So most of the major companies that still exist today that are providing textured proteins really started around this time period. So when you're looking at the history of extrusion texturized proteins, the early products started in the 1960s. 
And then in the 1970s, interestingly enough, um, here at Winger, we developed a product that we would consider a predecessor to today's HMMA or HME or HMEC, whoever you want to refer to, high moisture meat analogs. Um, so Unitex was the product that we developed in the 1970s. However, the market wasn't ready for that kind of a product. The market was still okay and able to and happy to use the early textured products made for so from soy flour. Um, and certainly the availability of raw materials was probably limited at that time. In the 1980s, with the introduction of the twin screw extruder to the food processing industry, um, this definitely started to change the, the, the number of categories and the type of categories of texture proteins that were created. And we'll touch base a little bit on some of these different textures. Um, in the 1990s, wet extrusion process was commercialized from our end and diversification of texture protein products continued to evolve, going into more fibrous soy proteins or fibrous uh, proteins in general and some HMMA applications. However, consumer-driven development of sustainable, healthy, and nutritious products, which is where we're at here in the 2000s, really has changed everything in terms of what's going on in this space. So textured vegetable proteins, um, which are, um, as you all know, a shape, layered, fibrous, and expanded product, they may be used to extend or replace an animal protein um, and it's made from a proteinaceous flour from a vegetable source that has been transformed by some form of thermal and mechanical energy is really the focus. Um, and as you see highlighted there, there's many different names that this protein tends to go by. Um, so texture vegetable proteins are either uh, trademark names such as TVP or TPP or TSP, or they may be referred to as HMMA as we do, uh, high moisture meat analogs or high moisture extrud extrudeds, um, meat analogs in general, plant-based meats. So it really just depends on who you're interacting with and which um, company um, has um, introduced you to their terminology um, and how you really understand what's going on here. So I see Shadu launched a poll here. Um, on what product category of texture proteins will you produce? Uh, so we'll give you a couple of chances to answer this question here. So just about 10 more seconds, um, just to give everybody a chance and then we'll share the results and see where you fit in, in terms of this full question. Okay. There you go. Okay, perfect, thank you. So as we can see, a lot of focus is really on high moisture meat analogs, but there's definitely an interest in the dry texture proteins as well. Um, and obviously a lot of interest in both applications as well. Um, each one has its space in the market and uh, thank you, we can close those results now. So each category has its space in the market. So whether you're looking at high moistures or dry textured, um, dry textured, as you can see here, has many different shapes and appearances um, and um, is typically shelf stable. Um, it's easy to store. It does not require any specialized transportation system or specialized storage or handling. Whereas with the high moisture meat analogs, because they tend to be high in moisture, you typically have to be concerned about how you're gonna store and how you will handle the material in order to avoid any food safety concerns. So when it comes to extrusion processing, the extruder is really the center of um, our, our process. And what happens inside of the extruder when it comes to texture proteins? Um, this is best described by this image where it shows the native tertiary protein um, of your raw materials, which is really the, the configuration that the proteins within your raw materials would typically be found in. And then with the cooking inside of the extruder, you get a denatured protein. And then once you're denatured the protein and you've unraveled and broken some of those um, secondary bonds, you essentially go into realignment and cross-linking and texturization. So the alignment and the cross-linking typically takes place in the dye. And this is really dependent on um, the type of dye configuration and dye design, what kind of alignments you will achieve. 
So requirements for denaturing protein are heat, time, and moisture, and primarily heat and time. Um, if you think about cooking an egg, um, and one question that came across uh, earlier through GFI that one of you had, uh, somebody had submitted um, was, is extrusion ultra processing? Um, if you really think about it, extrusion is really just a cooking process. Um, extrusion is essentially similar to cooking an egg on the stove. You're really just introducing heat and time to cook a product. And uh, you're introducing a little bit of pressure to help with the speed of the cooking process. Um, if you think about it, when you increase your pressure, you're helping to um, you know, break some of those bonds uh, a bit quicker to help to cook and denature the protein a bit quicker. But you're really not doing any ultra processing. Where the focus should be is really how are your raw materials handled and what do you do with the protein after the fact. But extrusion is really nothing but a cooking technology that has enabled us to get access to nutritious and safe foods that are ready to consume. And to also help us to diversify our access to nutritious and textured proteins in this case. So when it comes to what happens inside of the extruder, if we start to look a little bit more in detail, um, and I'll do a little bit of a comparison between the dry texture proteins and the high moistures as well here. But when you look at the extrusion process, you have a feeding zone at the very start where raw material is entering the extruder and has been either prehydrated in the preconditioner or we're introducing some moisture at the beginning stages of the extruder. Um, then it goes through a kneading zone and a mixing zone and then finally through a final cooking zone. So if you look initially, your product is typically flowable and has um, granular or powdery consistency. And then as you start kneading the zone, you essentially get a dough-like consistency, dough-like mass. So relatively viscous material. And as you get further down into the cooking zone, you get a properly melted viscous, fluid, viscous material that is able to be pushed out through the dye and shaped. So, if we look at what happens in configuring an extruder for dry texture proteins, we have re dry recipe delivery um, in the inlet here, and then addition of steam, any other liquids or water into the system, wherever applicable and dependent on what ingredients you're processing. Um, so the material just gets into the extruder barrel and then gets quickly conveyed away from the inlet towards the kneading and cooking zone. So the product, the raw material gets compressed as it goes through the extruder and it gets exposed to heat and pressure and shear and finally gets into a melted state before it reaches the dye where you get the final forming of your product. So basically due to shear and friction within the extruder, you're cooking the protein. And due to pressure difference, coming from the extruder into atmospheric, you get expansion of your product. The kind of expansion that you create and also the kind of um, texture that you create and direction of fiber formation um, or expansion or bubbles um, is really dependent on the kind of dye configuration and dye design you have here at the end. When it comes to configuring the extruder for high moisture analogs, the process is also very similar. You have your recipe delivery into the inlet, conveying of raw materials away from the inlet and into the kneading and cooking zone. And then finally, flow restriction at the dye and forming. The only difference here is that your section where your forming takes place is much longer. Here you have laminar structure um, with the cooling section. So here you're depending on heat transfer to make sure that your proteins realign. Um, as we talked about earlier, if you look at once you've unraveled your protein structure, you're trying to realign your proteins to create a texture. And the kind of texture also you will create is not only process dependent, but it's also uh, raw material dependent. That's something to keep in mind as well. So we accidentally asked this question a bit earlier, so we know that your focus is diverse. So with that in mind, we're gonna go into discussing a little bit more about the different categories of texture proteins. So the most familiar one is um, chunk, mince, and flake texture protein. And this one typically has 
uh, range of sizes. Um, it can be a chunk, it can be minced, it can be flaked. Um, and what we focus on is really when you're working at dried textured proteins, um, you are extruding at a relatively, you know, considerable moisture between 20 to 40 percent, depending on the materials that you're working with. And then you're drying down to below 10 percent. So this protein, this, this uh, raw material, then can be um, influencing what kind of hydration you actually get with these products. So you have to, before you use it in your final application, before you consume it, whether you're using it in your home to create a meal or you're using it in the food service or uh, you're creating a product that's for the retail space, you typically are gonna be concerned with your water absorption or these proteins. So as you can see here, different protein, different raw material sources tend to have different water absorption. And also they tend to take different amount of time to hydrate, all important parameters to consider when working on this on this product or working in generally in production. Um, so as you can see here, the top uh, photo shows a chunk style and then below that are, are smaller particle sizes that can be used for different applications. And example application is a hamburger patty. Um, this is uh, Morningstar products. Um, were I think one of the older products that I've seen on the market before um, the big um, excitement around the newer products that are actually available in the in the food service space. And um, these products typically used uh, textured soy protein concentrate with addition of other ingredients that may uh, serve a function such as binding, or they might serve a function to provide flavor or texture or mouthfeel. So as you can see here, the ingredients that are listed all have a specific function within the formulation. So going into a different category of products, I mentioned fiber soy protein. This is a product that is also a dry product, as you can see on the top photo. It's also a dry product that's typically rehydrated and creates very unique fibers. Um, and these fibers can be pulled apart and reshaped and reconfigured uh, to make a different kind of meat analog. So really dependent on what kind of final application you want to create, this may be a suitable product to work with. Um, obviously, you also need to have access to the right materials to produce. The sizes of this product also vary. So you can go from 6 to 20 millimeters and typical water absorption is about 3.4 uh, times the 3 to 4 times the dry. Another category is a structured meat analog. So this is actually a dense product that, as you can see on the image below, underneath the dry product, um, it has a very dense meat-like structure. And it's retort stable and um, has various applications. The only drawback of this product is that it takes a long time to actually rehydrate, but it has decent water absorption and is shelf stable when processed um, initially. So your product comes out of the extruder, again, within the 20 to 40% range of moisture. And once you actually extrude it, it goes through a drying process. And once it goes through a drying process, it's actually shelf stable and ready to be sold to your final consumer uh, or to your business or to your retail space, depending on how you intend to market the product. And finally, we're moving on to the high moisture meat analogs. So this category is um, really popular at this stage and uh, very exciting because of its composition, which is typical or closest to meat as can get uh, from extruded texture proteins at this stage in terms of research and development. Um, it has a layered and fibrous structure, again, dependent on the kind of materials and also the configuration of the system. Um, and uh, typical composition is 60 to 70% moisture, which is not unlike meat products. Um, fat content can range between two to 5% or may be completely excluded. Um, again, fat is typically added for mouthfeel or a certain nutritional profile. And then protein content can vary. It can be as little as 10 to 15% in the finished product that has the high moisture, or it can be up to 25 to 35%. Uh, obviously, depending on what kind of texture you're trying to achieve in the process, that's going to dictate how much protein you really need to have in the formulation. 
Um, it's similar to a cut of meat and you can cut it, grind it, shred it, handle it any way you like. That would be similar to the way you would handle meat. The only drawback here, as I mentioned, is it must be frozen or retort package um, because it will go bad at room temperature. So it's very critical to ensure food safety when working with this product. Some example applications include a pot pie or fettuccine or a pulled barbecue, um, a pulled pork or pulled chicken um, application. So when it comes to dry texture proteins, we talked about there's many shapes, textures, and sizes. And um, really it depends on the kind of application that you're trying to create. Um, here we also have some larger um, pieces that we call steaklets. Um, so these are actually really the size of a palm and may be used as is, and they may be rehydrated and used in a finished application. Um, you may have smaller strips and some instances, some companies may choose to use this as a snack product as well. Um, it really just depends on what is the final application and how you intend to market your product. So just a comparison of process moisture levels. The dry texture proteins really range between 23 to 40% moisture, depending on the kind of product category that you're looking at. Um, whereas the high moisture products are typically already high in moisture and range between 60 to 75%. And in some instances, you may go lower in the moisture content in these, but in your finished application that goes to the final consumer, typically this would be the moisture content. So here's an example of some different wet texture proteins and textures and colors that are possible within the process. This is also very possible with the dry texture proteins as well where you're able to create a range of colors and shapes. Um, when it comes to market readiness, it's really important to keep in mind how ready is your market for the product that you're interested or excited to market. Um, you know, I would love in a year from now to see high moisture meat applications, um, you know, more available or more, um, or really just on the market in the Indian market that are coming from the local market. Um, but whether or not the market is ready, that's something to be evaluated. So we talked a little bit about what is the difference between the 70s and current day? Um, what is the difference between the 2000s? So really the power of media. Um, we have much more information. We are exposed to a lot more um, information and resources and advice and in terms of what's good for us and we're able to research our food and whether or not we agree with food manufacturing practices so we're also concerned about our planet we're create we're considering creating a sustainable future and the modern consumer kind of has a lot of different values whether they are just trying to reduce the amount of meat for one reason or another, whether it's to save our planet or whether it's to uh, feel better or to improve their health or improve their performance, or they want to participate as part of, um, you know, social groups, um, whether they want to take part in, a, in an event where they're trying to reduce their meat, such as Veganuary or Meat Free Mondays. So really, the modern consumer is very interesting. And with that in mind, I'd like to ask you, who is your target consumer? Is it the flexitarian? Uh, is it the vegetarian, vegan, other? Are you not sure who your consumer might be? Um, these are all questions I think are very important to ask because if we're beginning with the end in mind, when we're starting to look at what happens in the extrusion process, um, it certainly helps uh, to understand who we're targeting and who we're creating a product for because you can create something marvelous but um, it's just there's no consumer base um, that is going to flop just like the unitex product so with that in mind i think we can um, if we're good with the results there sure dual we can go ahead and share so that's that's really interesting to see that the majority is focusing on the flexitarian market and um, we definitely think that's, um, that's the majority of the consumer base. So it's interesting to know. So alternative meat landscape. Uh, so the alternative meat landscape has changed really how we look at, um, how we look at 
consuming plant-based proteins and really just their availability, not only in the retail, but also in food service. And um, I'm gonna do one more poll right now. And the question will be for you guys, what market segment are you intending to target your product? Uh, will it be the supermarkets, um, independent and specialist retailers? Um, are you gonna look at convenience store or specialty markets and export in nearby countries? Or you're looking at other market areas to be discovered at this time? Hey, Natasha, as we get the answers to this particular poll, just a quick note here, the, the supermarket hypermarket that is organized retail mm -hmm. um, in India is only about 15% of the retail market. Okay. We have a huge unorganized independent retailer, long tail of, uh, you know, which is not digitized and not, or which is kind of informal. So that yeah. will heavily influence, I think, the target markets here. Yeah. No, that's really interesting to know, honestly. Um, and I, I think it's also to, important to keep that in mind when you're thinking about what kind of product you're creating as well. Um, so that is really my intent. My intent with asking these questions is really just to prod, um, to think, um, to ask everybody where they're focusing their energy on. So we can go ahead and share those results now. Okay, so again, um, I guess the target is the supermarkets and hypermarkets, and I'm going to guess those are probably matching the high moisture meat analogs as well. And uh, that is a nice broad range of areas to target. So we go back now. We know what we're looking at, what kind of final product we, we might have in mind. We kind of know what kind of texture we might want to get. Um, so how do we achieve that texture? We begin with the ingredients. If you look at the extrusion process, um, what goes into the extruder includes both um, feed, um, so it can be anything from cereals, legumes, oil seeds, um, animal products even, um, obviously water and steam, aids for extrusion, and additives that may enhance flavor, or texture, or appearance. And finally, after the extrusion process, we're going to talk about what happens? Uh, how do you handle your product? Do you dry? Do you roast, fry, bake, flavor, coat? Um, many other options in terms of what you can do before you get a finished product. So when it comes to ingredient sources, um, I put this uh, graphic together to sort of keep in mind what we're looking at. Um, so traditionally, the most common uh, source for texture proteins is really soy. But we've definitely seen a lot of, um, and I shouldn't exclude wheat from that because soy and wheat protein um, have really been the focus of the industry uh, up until recently. And with interest, growing interest in pea proteins, um, we definitely see interest in other product sources as well. So looking at rice protein, uh, which may be used to supplement the amino acid profile, corn proteins, um, pseudo cereals such as amaranth and quinoa. And we're definitely seeing a lot of excitement around chickpeas um, and uh, fava beans and beans in general and lentils. There's other proteins as well that texture as well, such as peanut protein. That was one of the questions that I received. And yes, it is possible to texture as protein. However, you need to make sure that the protein is actually functional and has not been heat damaged. Um, and there isn't really high oil content in there. We'll talk a little bit about that. So when it comes to the number of uh, resources um, or ideas in terms of what ingredients you can use in the process, it's really quite broad. But the biggest question is what is actually commercially viable in the quantities that you will need and at the price point you're gonna need in order to create a product that's targeted to your market. And obviously there's developing products that are um, being researched at this time that um, are still just on lab scale and our concept development. So when it comes to ingredient processing, these are some, of, this is just sort of an example graphic of what are some of the steps that raw materials tend to go through. So from the material that comes from the field um, that needs to be of a certain quality as well before it goes into the food stream, um, you might go into a milling process, a separation to remove any uh, starches or fibers um, to get a protein containing fraction. Then you might have further refining where you're creating isolates uh, or concentrates. 
um, that, that can be used into the texturization process. So what stage and what steps your ingredients go through um, influences what kind of properties your ingredients will have at the end of the day before they go to the extrusion process. And not all proteins and uh, protein isolates and concentrates are the same. So a protein concentrate that might be intended for beverage applications might not be suitable for extrusion application. So defatted soy flours and grits are usually the most common and more affor most affordable um, protein source that we've come across at, that we see um, most of, to be most available as a source, uh, as an ingredient. Um, typically has about 53% protein and about 70 PDI. Soy concentrate, uh, on the other hand, is a little bit higher in protein, up to 69%. Again, uh, PDI levels tend to vary, uh, typically has bland flavor. So, so these are some of these parameters that you would be looking at. What is the fat content, protein content, amount of fiber, sugars, and what is the particle size? So soy isolate, if you're looking at that, you're looking at about 90% protein. Again, also very bland and typically a high PDI, so highly functional. But just because it has a high PDI does not necessarily mean that it's suitable to your extrusion application. And we're looking at more interest in mechanically pressed soy flour recently because there's a focus on organic proteins, organic texture proteins that have not gone through solvent extraction. Uh, typically, in order to get your fine protein, there's some sort of a solvent extraction process in play. And oftentimes, that's not always organic friendly or um, consumer friendly. So mechanically pressed flours are typically lower in protein content. They do have a range of PDIs and uh, they tend to result in a darker product, softer product that has more random sizes. Uh, pea proteins, on the other hand, um, have various behaviors. Um, they can be used to make high moisture, dry textured. Um, it really just depends on what you're targeting. It is very possible to create whatever product you're looking at as long as the right materials are available. Chickpeas, same. Um, they have an interesting um, fiber structure. Um, um, they have a light color. Typically, they lighten upon hydration, even though if you look on the image below, those are the dry texture proteins below. And these are hydrated products that have been used to make uh, chickpea nuggets. Um, so really, it just... Um, it depends on your processing and your raw material. So a dark color might not necessarily be indicative that it's not gonna work for your application um, until you realize how you're gonna handle it. When it comes to raw material selection, they all have different functionalities. So whether um, they are gelling or binding or they promote flow or they provide flavor. Um, the important thing is to understand what each ingredient is contributing to the process during the R&D stage so we can manage product quality during production. And with that, I have a question, and that is what ingredients do you currently use or intend to use in your process? Um, so you have a range of proteins, and I selected here as your choices the ones that we um, most commonly see to be somewhat readily available. Um, again, the big question is, is your cost consumer looking for these ingredients? So it would be interesting to see what kind of ingredients you're currently intending to use or using in your process. And um, we'll give it a few more seconds, about five more seconds, and then I'll ask Shadul to share the results of this one. And we'll see where we stand. And then we'll go into talking a little bit more about important raw material characteristics. Okay, hey, there we go. So as I mentioned, soy is the predominant, wheat is the second, uh, pea is the second, sorry, and wheat is third. And then there's minor interest in some of the other applications. So pea, chickpea, wheat, soy. Okay, so we can move on. So when it comes to important raw material characteristics, what should you be looking at? Uh, first is protein functionality, another is protein quality, uh, protein content, uh, the pH of the material, uh, oil content, fiber, carbohydrates, so what kind of starches, and then 
Also, particle size. Particle size um, is really one of those characteristics of, that doesn't necessarily fall in line with the composition of the material, but rather the physical appearance. But it has a huge role to play in the extrusion process. If you have a material that has a really broad range of particle sizes within it, um, not very much can be done in the, on the hardware side to really make sure that the product can actually be processed through the extruder to give you a good quality product. So if you have something off, then your balance is gonna be off. And you're gonna create a product that might have some spotting or might have some strange appearance or inconsistency. So when it comes to protein quality, and this is the only thing I'll really cover to focus on is uh, protein dispersibility and nitrogen solubility. So you heard me mention a little bit about PDI, and this is the measure of the protein solubility in water, and it's sort of indicative of the level of heat treatment. Um, it's a, the PDI test is a relatively rapid test and it will give you um, good results and a good figure to go off of to compare raw materials one against the other. So if you also look at the color of the protein, um, that's also gonna be important to keep in mind. And typically the higher PDI matches up with a lighter color of product. And the really low PDI, which is typically intended to be used for feed and not necessarily food applications, um, would have a really low PDI and very um, a non-functional protein. So uh, with that in mind, we're getting closer to the end. And uh, my question for you is, what challenges are you facing with the ingredients you're currently using or planning to use? Um, and uh, the choices are price, consistency, quality, availability, diversity, maybe something other, or it's not applicable to you because you're not trying to source ingredients or planning to use, and you're here for a different reason. So we'll give you about five more seconds to give us an answer there um, in terms of what are your challenges. Okay. So we may go ahead and share results now. Okay, so that's quite a lot of diversity, um, but the number one is quality. And um, that is uh, typically the biggest challenge that most companies have regardless of where they are across the world. Um, okay, then we go back to um, thinking about our process. So in terms of our process, we need to think about what kind of final product we want to create. Looking at the composition of various animal proteins, um, such as chicken, uh, tuna, mutton, um, beef, pork, um, if we look at those, the protein ranges um, between 14 to 23% protein, might be up to 25% protein. So this is going to be matching what kind of formulation you need to put together um, if you're trying to emulate a protein. However, one thing to really keep in mind is gonna be also, what is the quality of the protein in your formulation? So what is the amino acid profile? In order for a product to be really nutritious, it's really important to have a certain um, amino acid profile that's readily available for the consumer. Um, so this can be evaluated typically with methods that are readily available. And I believe GFI has done quite a bit of research on this and put together some information on that that you can look at. But the protein content is important. And then the fat content, um, you're a little bit limited in the extrusion process in terms of what you can put in um, in order to not inhibit the texturization process. Typically the rule of thumb is less than 5% of fat added into the extrusion process but obviously this can vary. Um, and it really depends on your formulation. And then the water content really ranges um, between 50 to 80%, depending on the kind of protein you're trying to emulate. So with that in mind, you really need to decide what type of final product are you trying to achieve? Are you making um, a hybrid product? Um, are you trying to create a vegetarian, a vegan product? Or are you actually trying to texturize meat? Um, that's a lower value meat. Um, and this doesn't necessarily match with our intention of being sustainable, but it matches our intention of being um, flexitarian. Um, 
and actually, sorry, it does matter intention to be sustainable, but it doesn't matter intention if we're trying to be vegetarian or vegan. So um, deciding which texture or which protein you're going to be targeting is going to determine or dictate what texture you're going to be formulating for and what shape you're going to be looking at. So going with that in mind, if we start looking at a new product development cycle, which is really the core of most food processing companies, um, you're going to start with an idea somewhere. And as you scroll through the different uh, components of a new product development cycle or different sections of a new product development cycle, um, you're going to be looking at different things. So with the first thing is going to be, what are your finished product characteristics? This is going to dictate what happens in terms of the extrusion process, what ingredients you're going to put in, and also what kind of hardware you're actually going to select. So if you are knowing what kind of protein you're going to work with, it's um, as you go through your concept and business analysis and you've decided what kind of texture you're going to work with, you go through your product development stage. And here's where you determine what process characteristics are important. Um, such as the ingredients that you're going to use and what operating conditions and hardware you're going to need in your process. And then finally, as you go through to, you've done your test marketing and you go through to your commercialization stage, you're going to be looking at how you can scale from research to production and what is important in that step. And this is starting to look at um, your equipment. Um, this is the factor to keep in mind. How small can the development equipment be in order for you to be able to scale it or size it up to the equipment that you're actually going to be producing in? So if you look on the very bottom left image, that's a little lab extruder that, very, that is very tiny. So the difference between that tiny extruder and the big machine on the right hand side, which can do quite a few tons an hour, is going to be really heat transfer. So while you might volumetrically increase uh, an extruder, um, you're not really increasing the surface area. So you're not really getting the same heat transfer that you would get on a small machine as you would get on a large machine. So if you're looking at research articles and you're looking at what has been done on an academic scale, do also keep in mind or be uh, cognizant of the size of the equipment that that research has been completed on. And with that, uh, we're going to ask you what kind of protein is your product aiming to replace? And you can select all that apply to your application. And I have one more poll question before we go to more of your questions here. So the choices here, you have mutton, lamb, chicken, beef, pork, seafood, or another protein. And again, we'll give you a couple of more seconds, so about five more seconds, and uh, we'll share the results for this one. So thinking about what kind of protein to create. Okay, so chicken is really the focus um, by a significant percentage, and an interest in some of the other protein sources as well. So which one of these proteins you're going to work with is really going to be influenced by what cuisine and texture you're trying to target. When we look at plant-based meat analogs and some of the other plant-based companies have highlighted this, is you start going into the European market, the Asian market, the Australian market, Africa, North America, oftentimes there are differences in terms of expectations for texture as well as flavor. And that's something to be keeping in mind then, uh, when it comes to India, what is the cuisine and what is the texture that you are going to be targeting? What is it that you're trying to achieve? And how can you leverage that to match the right product characteristics? Um, how will you intend to use it finally? Um, what kind of processing it needs to withstand and how long it needs to retain its texture um, and how stable it needs to be? Uh, keeping in mind that certain factors such as pH might impact your texture, um, certain processing might impact your flavor profile, and then some downstream handling. Uh, will it affect your stability or food safety? Um, so those are some of the things that you need to keep in mind. And as I said, um, we begin with the end in mind and keeping in mind that the first step is really a complete understanding of what it is you want to make.
So deciding between dry, um, so dried textured proteins that are low moisture processing versus high moisture extruded proteins. Um, these are some of the, the factors that are gonna dictate what it is you work with. Uh, the texture, your mouthfeel, the applications that it's intended to go into, um, and the ingredient and formulation that you're able to put together and that you need to put together to achieve that product. Um, and also, the um, I mentioned with the ingredient and formulation, I think about also the price point of the protein um, and the finished product as well. And then the process flow and the final product handling. And my last question for you is going to be, what final shape will you target? And you may select all that apply, whether it is patties, nuggets, kebabs, strips, chunks, or something else. And considering we might be looking at majority, might be looking at chicken, I'm assuming it's going to be mostly strips and chunks that we're going to be looking at, or perhaps nuggets. So. Let's see. We'll give you three more seconds, and I think Shadil, you can go um, ahead and share this last so, one. <laughs> um, actually, I don't have that question. I have the NPD cycle question. Are you currently in as a last? Oh, question. that's okay. That's fine. Sure. NPD cycle will be fine. That's our new one. We can skip this one. It's no problem. Awesome. So the question is, what stage of your new product development cycle are you currently in? Are you evaluating market potential and market performance? Are you looking at concept development? Are you still in the business analysis stage? Are you working on product development? Um, are you test marketing or are you looking at commercialization? And the reason why I asked this question is, is uh, delving into my next stage of um, sharing a little bit more about how we can be of support to you. So we'll give you, I'd like to get most of the, most, um, as many people answering in this one. So I'll give a little bit more time. Um, so, so whenever you're ready, I'll let you decide uh, when to share the results. Yeah, let's just give it five more seconds. Uh, everybody who wants to vote in, please do so now through the polling option on your dashboard. Awesome. Perfect. And here are the results. All right. So you're, most of you seem to be in the stage of product development. So that kind of matches what I'm driving into next. And this is to talk a little bit about our technical research center and our analytical lab, and also our R&D partners, um, sorry, and our R&D partners that, or external test sites that you can work with. So our technical center currently, as I mentioned, the image on the top right is our old technical center. And the image on the bottom is our current center being demolished and uh, being built from the inside out. And um, we are very excited to have that up and running early uh, next year, fully operational. We're still running. Uh, we've been going, uh, we've been doing R&D trials throughout this whole time, even with construction going on. So we really have never stopped. Um, in terms of what's available there, we have seven extruders, both singles and twin screws. We have three different dryers and coolers. We have multiple ancillary equipment, such as coating and milling and cutting available, as well as fully automated um, control system. Um, we do equipment design and testing, and uh, we focus on customer product and process development. So our technical center is open, um, you know, all year round and uh, most of our existing customers and new customers tend to take advantage of this facility um, in terms of support and R&D there. Um, however, we also do have R&D partners or external test sites and we work with the following universities um, that may be able to conduct product and process development with or without Winger. Um, so if you choose to want to work with our equipment and uh, you want to just work through university, you're just still in ideation stage, you're not yet ready yet to get to a commercial state or work with equipment, uh, this would be one direction to take in as well. And we also do work with some of these universities right now as well because of our construction. So for some instances um, where we've had to do R&D and our equipment has been uh, disassembled, we've been able to use some of these facilities. 
And um, additionally, we do training and education of our customers, uh, and we participate in university seminars, and we're always excited to work with organizations and share our knowledge and experience. And uh, the person that you see in the image here is somebody that I'm a huge fan of, even though I work with him, and that's Galen, and he's been with the company about 48 years now. And when I first started with Extrusion, most of the information that I came across in this space was actually research that he had done in his early years with Winger. And with that in mind, uh, just some final summary about where we are in terms of Winger. We're based globally. We have over 400 employees worldwide. Uh, as I mentioned, we have both third and fourth generation family members working in our company at this time. We invest heavily into R&D and equipment development. And we have over 1,600 systems system supplied to the industry globally, over 6,500 countries uh, with installations that are operating and uh, that we're serving. And we have over 50 patents registered for extrusion related equipment designs. So we like to work with our customers and customize the solution specific to their application. Um, and uh, we're open to customizing and adjusting equipment and we're here to support with product development and with our many years of experience um, you know since the 1960s we've been exposed to quite a lot of different proteins and raw materials to the point that we're able to evaluate whether or not an application or raw material is going to work um, in a certain application so if you are interested in pursuing a certain product you can send us a small sample um, of raw material and a texture protein and um, we would be able to tell you whether or not it would be possible to texturize the raw material and also what equipment you may need to create that product. So with that in mind I'd like to leave you with the idea that extrusion is a very flexible process that using the proper raw materials, hardware and processing techniques you can create a wide range of food, feed and industrial products. And um, what are your requirements? So thank you for your attention. And at this time, Sardul, Varun, you guys can ask any questions you might have. Sure. So we have received a bunch of questions through the Q&A button and we'll, we can actually cover a few of them in the you know 14 odd minutes we've left on this webinar. Uh, firstly, thank you so much, Natasha. It was a great presentation. I think it gave um, all the attendees, a lot of things uh, across, you know, the uh, spectrum of extrusion and, you know, about the process, about products, a lot of great insights specific to the plant-based meat, uh, plant-based seafood category as well. So um, thank you for that. Uh, I think we have a few questions which we can quickly take uh, and you can check them in the Q&A button as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, this question is about, uh, can you give us some insights about uh, use of extrusion for plant-based seafood, especially fish? Um, you know, what kind of ingredients, temperature, pressure, insights, anything you could share on that front? Yeah, so in terms of the conditions, it's really ingredient dependent. That's really difficult to share anything specific on that. Um, the ingredients that you will use really will just depend on what kind of seafood you're targeting and also what kind of texture you're going to be looking at. So without really knowing exactly um, what it is that you're targeting, Specifically, without seeing a sample, it's very difficult to share what kind of conditions to share. But um, as I said, they're welcome to reach out to me. Um, my email is listed right here on the slide, ntoseskiatwanger.com. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any specific questions that they might not want to share um, information on on this site. Yeah. Would it be possible, I wonder, to, to just share a generalized um, understanding of what, so if, if we say that a target product, let's say fish, is mm -hmm. more um, is more flaky than uh, than you might want in the chicken product, which might be more fibrillar. Um, is there anything that we can say about how that might affect the processing parameters? Let's say we were using identical ingredients for both. If we were using soy for both, yeah. So again, it would really just depend. So sometimes you tend to choose ingredients um, that are going to match a certain appearance. So you might not necessarily go on the hardware side or the processing side of conditions. You might actually be looking at manipulating the formulation if you're trying to look at different appearance and texture. So, you know, you can, for example, let's say um, I'll give you an example. If you want to create something that's firmer, you typically will add more protein, right? 
if you want to create something that's softer or more expanding, then you're going to add a little bit more starch in the formulation. You're going to go lighter on your protein. Um, in terms of your conditions, you really have to manage your uh, thermal mechanical energy that you're putting into the system. And that's really dependent on the equipment that you're also using. So I can give you, you know, screw speed and temperatures and feed rate, but it's really equipment dependent. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a question that's really difficult to answer, uh, you know, vaguely like this. Yeah. Got it. Uh, I think a couple of questions are on people who would like to collaborate with you, you know, in Asia region or specifically India region, universities who might want to set up pilot scale facilities for R&D or entrepreneurs who might want to set up technical centers in India or Asia. Can you throw some light about the general process uh, of engaging and, you know, what do you really look at before, you know, uh, yeah. establishing such a facility? Yeah. Yeah. We're very open with collaborating and um, we'd be happy to discuss that they're welcome to reach out to, to me directly, yeah. Great, I'd also like to add that we are in conversation with many of you here in, in, in attendance today, as well as with others who are interested in uh, thinking through how they might set up extrusion facilities and we are um, funneling those requests through to Wenger as well. Um, Natasha, there's a question here in the, in the chat, not in the Q&A about mm -hmm. cooling dyes and how they affect so just that kind of combinatorics or mix and match on, on components like cooling dyes and how they might affect the process. Yeah. So when it comes to the cooling dye, really what's really important there is really heat transfer. So the design of the dye where you have adequate heat transfer is really what's critical. Um, so having you know, a certain length of a dye and having a certain temperature that you're able to achieve um, and also a certain heat transfer, those are all going to be important parameters in order to determine the kind of texture and, and, um, and uh, vibration uh, of your finished product that you're going to be targeting. Um, yeah, I, I, really, like, I really don't know how to, how to give you enough information on that one. Um, am I answering your question? Because it's really very, very much design dependent. Yeah, I think so. I think, the, I mean, I think the answer is always it depends. Yeah. Um, there might be some generalizable insights, but on the whole, there's so much customization. If you want to get to a product that's better than your grandfather's soy nuggets, you have to, um, you have to do a lot of customization on the, on the, the equipment and the process and the inputs and all of that. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. And, you know, different companies use different materials as well to design their equipment. There's obviously internal uh, designs that are going to impact the kind of heat transfer you're getting into the system. And obviously also as you're working with different materials, you're going to be looking at different temperature profiles that you're trying to achieve. You know, some proteins might like lower temperature, some proteins might need more heat. Um, it's really, yeah, it's, it's really dependent. So um, the best thing to do if you really want to figure out where you stand is to invest time and um, effort into doing research um, and developing your product. And that's why I was mentioning the universities and I was mentioning our technical center, because if they want answers on that end, this is the direction that we would suggest. Yeah, I'd just like to add that um, we have um, people from universities in India as well in attendance and I think the, the model that you have in place in St. Louis is really, really interesting um, to us in India as well, because it's a kind of a pivotal innovation hub that allows entrepreneurs to come in and get samples and see what their, what their product might look like at different parameters of, uh, of conditioning, et cetera. Uh, but um, I think we don't have that yet in India, which is part of the reason why we're conducting this masterclass, right? It's a real bottleneck in the Indian industry. So we'll try and take that forward as quickly as possible. Another issue of infrastructure, Natasha, in India is uh, distribution and cold chain in particular. So there's a nice, there's an interesting question in the Q&A here about, um, you know, do you need to handle things chilled or frozen, which I'll, I'll just expand out to um, thinking through extrusion or um, high moisture extrusion in particular, would there be additional processes that would be required to make something shelf stable as, in addition to high moisture extrusion beyond high moisture extrusion? Um. So are you talking about what can you do to create a high moisture product that's shelf stable? Yes. Are there other investments that are required 
uh, in order to get to a shelf stable product. So with high moisture, if you're looking at high moisture, um, obviously you need downstream processing equipment. So the only way that I can think of that you can make a high moisture shelf stable is really to can it or retort it. So um, some of the products that I've seen are uh, vegan products or in retort pouches. Um, um, so that's one way of doing that. And obviously that does require equipment investment that's gonna be for creating that kind of uh, packaging. Um, and then on the dry texture proteins, in addition to the extruder, you need a dryer. Um, so once going from the extruder, you would be conveying your material going into the dryer where it's gonna spend maybe 15 to 30 minutes drying to get the right, to, to get to the right moisture. The drying time might even be lower depending on the kind of product that you're creating. Um, and then once it's done, then you can just package it and it's shelf stable. Um, but yes, you would need, on the dry texture proteins, you would need a drying equipment. And on the high moisture analogs, you need either um, cooling or freezing or packaging equipment that's gonna be retorting or maybe vacuum sealing if you're intending to put it in the fresh meat section. Um, obviously your shelf, shelf uh, stability is gonna be much lower. And obviously you can add additives to kind of prevent, um, you know, to increase its, its stability to an extent, but that's obviously very limited because you're dealing with a high moisture product. So the chances of microbial growth are just the same as you would be looking at meat. So when looking at high moisture meat analogs, think of it as actual meat product, um, because it's gonna be the same way that you would handle, it's gonna be the same way that you would need to be thinking about it in terms of safety. Got it, that makes sense. Um... Yeah, so for all the questions which are specifically directed towards Natasha about cost of plants, R&D scale plants, the process of setting up a project, I would recommend you all to get in touch with her directly. Her email ID is currently being uh, shown on the screen. Maybe she'll also put it on the chat box so you know you can directly use it from there. Um, having said that, uh, are there any other questions you wouldn't like to cover right now? Varun, we have a ton, ton of them. Yeah, I see, I see in specific a lot of questions, Natasha, on utilizing um, novel protein sources like the ones that you mentioned on your slide, um, particularly related to even things like ground nuts and peanuts, um, but also pulses and other diverse sources. What kinds of preconditioning, what kinds of, um, what kinds of, I guess, what kind of scientific plan might one develop in order to validate the use of these products and the, the use of different ingredient mixes that go into the into the um, the extrusion process. Yeah, so sometimes it's really ingredient dependent what kind of uh, analytical methods you're going to use to characterize the functionality of these proteins. And another thing to keep in mind is that you might want to choose to do a combination of those proteins. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you're looking at nutrition and you're trying to create um, a protein that's supposed to be a replacement for meat, Sometimes plant proteins have a little bit of, um, you know, don't always have the full amino acid profile um, and you're going to need to be supplementing from one source or another. So you need to do a combination of proteins. So keeping that in mind in terms of the, what, the, what they would need to do in terms of evaluating a product, I think the easiest thing is to send us a sample to let you know whether or not it's something that we think is going to work. Uh, but also developing internal knowledge of different raw materials. But the biggest thing is working with ingredient suppliers. If you are working directly with ingredient suppliers, they'll be able to give you a good answer um, in terms of what parameters or what materials are suitable for your application. So if you look at some of the ingredient companies, they have protein isolates that are meant for beverage industry, and they have protein isolates that are meant for meat, meat products or dairy analogs. Um, it's really, it's really looking at that. So factors like protein composition, fat content, um, in the case of soy and pea, you might be looking at protein dispersibility index, um, you know, in, in terms of particle size, it's another factor to look at. Heat treatment. Um, if you are an ingredient producer, you're going to be looking at how much heat did I expose my protein to and for how long. If it's spent a long time being exposed to heat, it most likely is not necessarily going to be very functional. But again, it's ingredient dependent. 
And keeping in mind as well that some of these ingredients that I mentioned might have anti-nutritional factors that need to be overcome um, that don't necessarily get overcome in the extrusion process. So there's really a lot to do and uh, it's not a one answer fits all. Got it. It sounds to me like Natasha that um, collaborations among uh, companies like Wenger and ingredient companies might be very useful um, as the as the industry grows. I think it's worth stressing again, as I always do, that we are in the absolute infancy of this industry still. High moisture meat analogs and high moisture extrusion, whole muscle cuts, etc. While there have been academic papers for some time now, it's really been only the last five years that it's that it's come into the market. And so um, it's worth noting that there's a lot of work still to do to diversify the sources of raw materials and ingredients. So especially if you are an ingredient uh, manufacturer, I think there might be some interesting collaborations that the team at Wenger might want to take forward with you um, and think through how those translate into the market. I do have a final question on that note. Uh, from the perspective of business, or I guess business evolution, um, where do you think um, the where do you think the inherent technical advantage will continue to lie for entrepreneurs? Will it be in developing a superior, um, a superior high moisture meat analog that's made from novel sources? Uh, will it be perhaps in taking um, things that start to become more and more common from ingredient companies like TVPs that come out from ingredient companies and then putting them in a nice package and creating branding on top of that? Uh, where do you see the market moving over the next five, 10 years? So that's a really great question. Um, I, there's definitely growth in both areas. Um, I don't know the Indian market that well to really be able to give a really good indication of where the energy should be focused. But knowing my understanding currently of where we stand um, in terms of the protein space there, I think there's a lot of opportunity for entrepreneurs to take ingredients from ingredient companies and transform them into a finished product that's ready available on the market space. I think that's the best direction to head into. That would be the advice that I would have because then they don't have the heavy um, investment costs into equipment. And I would love to sell an extruder, but I think the reality is when you're in your beginning stages and you're trying to create momentum, and brand, um, I think it's really important to keep that in mind and rely on companies that are able to support you with consistent and reliable product. So in terms of the future, I, I would love to see more AGMMA. Um, I think there's definitely gonna be growth in that sector as well. Um, the question is, is the Indian market ready and how much, um, so what si what's the size of the market? Yeah, all great questions. Thank you so much for that insight. Shardul, I think we can, we can wrap up the Q&A portion of, of, the, of this masterclass now. Um, and perhaps Shardul, you can say a few words about the upcoming Smart Protein Summit. Absolutely. So uh, once again, thank you so much, Natasha, for joining thank us you. today and giving a very insightful webinar. I, I know for a fact uh, that all the attendees have loved it and a lot of community members from the GF Ideas India community have really found uh, ways to collaborate with you. So thank you once again. I'm going to take a minute to quickly tell everyone about Initiative Smart Protein Summit, which is coming from 6th to 10th of uh, October. So it's uh, right around the corner. And I'm just going to quickly share the screen and show you our, our website. And Varun, maybe uh, if you'd like to add a little bit of perspective about what can people expect uh, you know, during the summit, you can do that now. So yeah, essentially, absolutely. you can go on the website and register here, and then all the details, programming, all that scheduled will follow. You would be able to network with uh, tons of smart protein uh, stakeholders in India, and this is basically a summit for everyone, right? Whether you're an entrepreneur, a it's gone. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, great. So I, I just wanted to add to what Shardul said. Uh, the, the summit is just around the corner. We're very grateful to, to Wenger and our other sponsors uh, who are supporting us this year. Um, and I think that it's going to be fascinating because over five days, we're going to uh, dive deep into topics like this uh, and how we can very tactically move forward with building the Indian market uh, from where it is right now, where there are still key bottlenecks. But we're also going to talk about major goals for the next decade that we're going to partner with government for, like what's on the screen right now, uh, what we're calling our mission for smart protein. So I would encourage everyone to go to the summit. Um, it's on smartproteinsummit.com, simple enough to remember. 
um, and please do register. Uh, the agenda will be up, I believe, tonight or tomorrow. Uh, and we have some wonderful um, keynote speakers, uh, members of parliament, ambassadors from different countries, uh, people like Natasha and other uh, corporate leaders and great entrepreneurs from India and around the world. Perfect. Thank you so much, Varun. Um, so I'm just going to put the website for registration in the chat box so all of you can take a look at it. And uh, thank you once again for everyone who's joined us on this Friday evening. Uh, if you want to join the GF Ideas India community and be part of, this is the seventh, 17th webinar, right? We have a series of webinars um, uh, lined up for the future and a bunch of webinars done in the past, specifically for the smart protein sector and accelerating the ecosystem. So you can join the GF Ideas India community by mailing india at gfi.org. I'm just going to put both of these things in the chat box. Thank you once again for joining us and have a great weekend ahead. Bye, Natasha. Bye, Varun. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care.